Okay, so continuing off, um, continuing where I left off in the previous video, I discussed the Potsdam uh, Institute chart showing tipping points around the planet, cryospheric, circulation, biosphere, and I talked about the connections from one to the other, how you can get compound tipping points. You tip one place, it causes a cascade to another thing, to another thing, how the system can quickly get out of control, you know, being a highly nonlinear system. Now I'm talking about chapter 15 in the U.S. Climate Report, and, you know, an example of these cascading or compound events would be simultaneous drought in agricultural regions, maybe flooding in other regions, like record flooding in Europe in vegetable growing regions, for example, and this would severely reduce the, the supply of food around the planet, and then this would cause massive civil unrest and huge human hardship around the planet. So the world is vulnerable to these sort of things. Um, another example is for, you know, failures of companies. So uh, there was um, heavy and severe precipitation in the U.S. Midwest. There were record insurance payments. Um, and the insurance companies, a bunch of them sued the city, saying they didn't actually prepare for changes um, in a for impacts of a change in climate, sued the city of Chicago. The suit was dropped, but basically the insurance industry is not able to cope with the increasing frequency and occurrence of extreme events. Just look at the Caribbean islands, look at Puerto Rico. You know, we've had almost two months pass and there's still loads of people without power, without drink potable drinking water. You know, it's almost like a failed state, if you like. The Caribbean islands are, a lot of the Caribbean islands, smaller islands are even worse off. Okay, there's new types of compound events that, that we haven't seen in the historical record or they're not predicted by model simulations. Um, and these sort of things can happen. So here's an example, Hurricane Sandy, the sea level uh, brought in a storm surge, but it was a high tide and the water was very, very warm. So the, the, the sea level was higher off New York, high tide, all those things strengthened the storm there was a blocking ridge over Greenland, so this storm could not turn right, like just about every other hurricane in the basin. It turned left, went ashore in New York, um, and that blocking ridge could have been related to Greenland surface melt, reduced summer sea ice in the Arctic, and all these things. So that messed up the jet stream, which directed Sandy ashore. So, so those were cascading points. This is just a, a repeat of the previous um, the, the global version I showed you, focusing on the U.S. This is showing, um, what this is showing here is, these are billion dollar weather events from 1980 to 2016 in the U.S. and associated temperature and precipitation anomalies. The larger the dot, the worse the event. And what you can see is, you can see that there's a cluster in the U.S. The brown are the drought events, very severe drought events clustered here. You know, when it's hotter and drier, then those are the temperature, those are the anomalies relative to the long-term average. And we also get fires occurring in these conditions. So the incidence of wildfire, the fires are burning hotter, they're moving faster, they're behaving differently, they're a lot harder to put out. Okay, so now in terms of climate points, uh, climate tipping points, okay, the best paper, and I think it's open source now, Lenten 2008 tipping points, you know, you can get the whole paper. Okay, I like that one. Um, it's got a very similar diagram to what I showed you. So we can talk about these tipping elements. And those are the different elements that were on that plot here, which I showed you. So these are the different elements in the climate system or in the Earth system that can tip. Um, and you get these, so self-amplifying cycles shift. You go from a new, uh, old state to a new state right climate change isn't linear you go up here then you jump up to a new state and continue on so you've gone through a tipping point you've crossed some threshold so the one that we're likely to approach first is the arctic ocean you know likely within five years this is business as usual you know not uh this is why and this is not necessary we are the only species in in the history as far as we know of, of on earth on on earth that have the ability to actually 
uh, control, you know, do things, not control, but change, change the future depending on what our present day actions are. So, you know, we need to, we need to declare it a climate emergency. We need a crash program to uh, put all the engineers and scientists around the world that are building weapons to kill people to figure out how to get them to readjust their thinking, to figure out how to take CO2 out of the atmosphere and how to cool the planet with solar radiation management. So um, anyway, in these, uh, these tipping points, some of the state shifts can occur right away, rapidly. Other ones take decades or centuries. They can be set in motion and the actual tipping can happen much later. Um, so there's a number of elements. So this is basically a chart uh, showing some of the elements that were in the, in the, um, the map. So AMOC, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. It can shift from where it is now, carrying warm water across the Atlantic to Europe, carrying warm water up to the Arctic. It can reduce in strength. It can form a, start forming a loop lower down. You know, it will definitely have regional temperature and precipitation effects. It'll affect the west, the east coast of the U.S. It'll affect all of Europe. Um, it'll affect the sea level. Uh, it'll raise sea level in those areas. Um, it'll, the global mean temperature could change. It'll cause a, a cooling um, of some regions, warming of other regions, regional sea level change. I mentioned that. The ENSO can increase in amplitude. So the El Ninos can become much more powerful, you know, and they have the El Nino, the ENSO has global effects. So if we change the nature and characteristic of it, it's going to have global effects, obviously. Um, equatorial atmospheric super rotation could be initiated and this will reduce cloud cover and also increase the climate sensitivity. I'll talk about this separately. Se separately equatorial atmospheric super rotation. This would be a complete rewiring, if you like, of the global atmospheric circulation systems with huge global implications. So, so I'll talk about this. Um, this could happen under the high emission scenarios and basically reconfigure the Earth very, very quickly. Um, regional North Atlantic uh, Ocean convection, major reduction in convection, regional temperature change. Of course, the cryosphere, Antarctic ice sheet melt increasing greatly, raising sea level, albedo changing, fresh water um, on the surface of the ocean, changing ocean circulation. Also the Arctic sea ice, major decrease in summer and perennial area, causing temperature changes, also changing the jet streams. Um, the jet streams aren't mentioned explicitly here. Um, Greenland ice sheet, major decrease in ice volume, uh, ch increasing sea level rise, reducing the albedo or reflectance of the Arctic, Arctic darkening, fresh water changing the ocean circulation, the AMOC, etc. Then we have the carbon cycle tipping points with hydrate release, ra greatly raising greenhouse gas gases in the atmosphere. Permafrost carbon, the Eudona, Eudoma uh, permafrost, huge release of carbon from from uh, organic material that's frozen in permafrost, huge greenhouse gas emission rises. Then we have the ecosystem changes, the Amazon rainforest dieback replaced by grasslands, a huge reduction of carbon sink, the boreal forest dieback transition to grasslands, huge reduction sink, and coral reefs, a huge hit to biodiversity and uh, you know, massive problems in the ocean and on the land, cascading to the land. So the AMOC is a huge component of global ocean circulation. So the cold, dense water, the Gulf Stream moves north, it cools down, it's saltier, it sinks near Greenland, and, and you get this ocean circulation pattern. So as you get more and more fresh water off Greenland from glacier melt, you can, the, the strength of the AMOC can decrease. You can get this, uh, this is already happening. Probably the warming hole in the North Atlantic, south of Greenland, it's not just freshwater melt from Greenland, it means the Gulf Streams come across and it's, going, it's not carrying as much heat across, so we get this hole, it's in a slightly different location. Okay, or maybe it's just internal variability. Okay, um, but there's a huge potential of this sort of thing happening. A slowing would have huge impacts to the U.S. Okay, sea level rise would accelerate off the northeastern U.S. 
a full collapse could result in 1.6 feet of, globe, of regional sea level rise off the U.S. So if it collapses, you can have a, an immediate rise within months or a year, a year or two, uh, 1.6 feet of sea level rise. A cooling, it says a cooling of, they're just talking about the U.S. I think, I think the heat would be trapped at lower latitudes. I think, I don't buy this cooling thing for the U.S. You definitely get cooling in Europe, but this is only U.S. centric. It's not talking about, about, about Europe. Um, it would reduce oxy carbon dioxide uptake according to this and accelerate uh, warming because greenhouse, the sinks would be reduced and the warming would increase. Okay. Um, the equatorial Pacific is the, the atmosphere ocean connections and water temperatures. That's basically um, important for the El Nino or the ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So this could shift, okay, the phases could shift. The El Nino could become much stronger, much less El La Nina. The triggering of these events could change, so it can, they, the, the frequency of occurrence could change, or you could get a permanent El Nino state. And of course, the ENSO greatly affects uh, weather patterns across the U.S., which areas are in drought, which areas get rainfall, etc. Okay, Arctic sea ice is mentioned here. You know, an abrupt state from into summer ice-free or even year-round ice-free state. So they talk about these things, year-round ice-free in the Arctic. Imagine a world like that, how things would be different. Okay, climate models have underestimated the rate of Arctic sea ice forever. Okay, they're not putting, accounting for some critical positive feedbacks and it could be greater high latitude storminess Ocean wave penetration as the sea ice declines, some warm water melting the ice from below. Um, more northerly incursions of warm air and water as the jet streams are wavier. You get more and more cold air going to low latitudes and more and more warm air replacing that up in the high Arctic, even in the middle of the winter when it's completely dark. Changes in water vapor, it's getting a lot a lot more water vapor in the atmosphere because warm water holds more moisture. So as the Arctic warms like crazy, it's getting more and more water vapor, a lot more rain events rather than a snow event, the ice albedo and so on. So um, there is not some natural variability, um, and, uh, but you know, the, the trends are all going down to loss to ice-free uh, summers. Um, you know, very, very soon, much faster. The data is showing, the observations, the data, uh, showing that this is much faster than the models are showing. Okay, so this will have a huge impact. Um, this would be a massive tipping event, and this is, I think, it was always a toss-up for me between this and collapse of the Amazon rainforest. It looks like the Arctic is winning hands down on that. There's also the carbon cycle. Okay, in the permafrost, there's 1,300 to 16 gigatons, 1,600 gigatons of carbon as the Arctic warms about five, you know, the top layers, the top couple of meters of the permafrost, it's five to 15% of this is estimated to be vulnerable. Five to 15% of this number can be vulnerable for release this century. So the heat would be enormous. When you get decomposition of organic carbon too, then that heat. So that causes more permafrost around to thaw and uh, cause even more heating. Okay, and depending on the oxygen availability, you can get methane coming up or CO2. Um, depends on the uh, hydro hydrological conditions, and of course, methane is a lot worse. Um, you know, you could get uh, so so that's a huge problem. Another part of the Arctic in the Arctic carbon cycle is the methane class rates that are on the sea floor and in the sediment. There's an estimated 500 to 3,000 gigatons. Look at the range on that. We don't really know. That's a six times range. Recent estimate, 1,800 gigatons of carbon. This would, if this was increased, it would be equivalent to, you know, you need to multiply by 34 times on a 100-year time scale, 86 times on a 20-year time scale. Actually, that 86 number has been updated recently to 96 times. Um, and this would basically change the change the atmosphere and change the warming and it would rocket us to much higher temperatures and it would dwarf all human emissions. 
Okay, now there's also the human element in the feedback systems, and this is saying that as the Arctic opens up, if we go and extract more fossil fuels from there, then we'll have more carbon to burn and will greatly rocket us up to warmer temperatures. I'm thinking more of the human element to apply carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management to prevent this from happening. I don't know where the time's going. I'll continue. <laughs>